Welcome to the second season of the Heart of Law podcast. My name is Marina Omizai, and I'm your host. We had an incredible first season with the nation's premier trial lawyers who shared so many valuable stories and their personal philosophy about life, law, and how to make the world a safer place. The feedback was extraordinary. People are watching and listening to this podcast from all over the world, and for that, I couldn't be more grateful. As I have mentioned before, this podcast is a passion project, and it has enriched my life in so many ways. Every attorney I bring on is someone that allows me to deepen my understanding and knowledge base on the legal industry, but also gives me new perspectives about my personal life, what causes are important to me, how to pursue them, and how to expand and grow as a person. So I couldn't wait to get back to season two and start this feel-good project again. My first guest for season two is an attorney I met in 2013. So it's been a while and I don't remember exactly how we met, but I remember how I felt in his company. He is very passionate, personable, very bright, very driven. And he has sent me some of my first cases to work on that gave me a chance to prove myself in my career early on. I will never forget that. And we have been good friends since. His journey is one that I think others will write books and make movies about because he's the person who's crazy enough to think that he can change the world, and he has. His name is Paul Farrell Jr. He is a founding partner of Farrell and Fuller and Farrell Law. Paul is considered to be one of the best trial lawyers in Southern West Virginia with experience prosecuting medical malpractice cases birth trauma cases, and negligent credentialing cases. He's a graduate of the University of Notre Dame in 1994 and the West Virginia University College of Law in 97. He filed one of the first transvaginal mesh cases in the country, which resulted in the consolidation of some 80,000 cases from across the United States in federal court in Charleston, West Virginia, where he served on the MDL Executive Committee. Since 2016, Paul has helped lead the opioid litigation and filed some of the first diversion cases in the country in Southern West Virginia, which initiated the proceedings leading to the formation of the multi-district litigation in 2017 and centralized in Cleveland, Ohio. He has been appointed co-lead of the MDL in the National Prescription Opioid Litigation, where more than 2,700 cases are pending in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Ohio. Um, Paul, thank you for being on the podcast. I'm just so honored and flattered that you accepted my invite. How are you? I'm doing well. That was a, a, a fancy introduction. Well, a fancy introduction for a fancy man. You've done a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. So you, you mentioned that we, we um, met in 2013 and we talked briefly beforehand. You don't remember it. So I wanted to share this with you. I, I don't so remember I'm how we met. In but yeah. 2013. Uh-huh. I, I, I know. So uh, I go to Chicago AAJ. Mm-hmm. And okay. at that point in time, I was a single event lawyer. Mm-hmm. which um, I never heard that term until I got into mass torts. I didn't know we were single event lawyers. I thought we were just trial lawyers, but I right. was doing medical malpractice. And I, I really enjoyed going to the summer and winter AAJ meetings because there were sections of lawyers that just did nothing but medical malpractice. And then there were also sections where there were lawyers that did nothing but birth trauma cases, right. which I was very interested in. Mm-hmm. So I, I, was, I went to the AAJ meeting. We were in Chicago and um, we were in that lobby of the hotel. Okay. And there you were with an entire gaggle of lawyers just pining over your attention and (laughs) part of it was that 
I wanted attention. And the other part of it is, is that I was a little put off because I don't know, I just kind of felt like the attention that you were getting was not necessarily wanted. Mm -hmm. And so um, I uh, walked up to you in this group of, of older lawyers and I said, hi, I don't mean to interrupt, but um, you said you were going to meet me down here and buy me a drink and talk about cases. And you went, yes, you are right. I am so sorry, fellas. I got, thank you very much. And then you <laughs> walked me up to the bar and, and, and you said, thank you. What's your name? <laughs> and that's, that's how we met. Wow. So I think that was 2012, not 2013, yeah. now that I think about it. Yeah. And that was my first AAJ conference. Yeah, you were a I rock star. Was, I was a woman on a mission. I had something to prove. Yeah. Um, but you are right. I think for many years, I got a lot of attention that was not necessarily people wanted to see how smart I was and what service I had to offer. I think as a woman, you know, in a male dominated industry, you get a lot of attention and, and I've tried to use that to my advantage um, and not let it hinder me in any way. So, you know, it's, I've, it's something that I've had to kind of work through, but all in right. all, it's been a great ride, a great experience. Well, I think you and I are both, um, you're obviously much younger than I am. But uh, I think that from the perspective of generational changes, I think uh, we're on the, the precipice of some, some big changes, some, some, a revolution in the gender power within our industries. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm seeing in the practice of law more and more women that are taking leadership roles in litigation and not just um, support roles. And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense that support roles aren't important, but from a business standpoint, mm -hmm. there is a, a very clear patriarchy that sit at the top of the pyramids of each of these law firms. Uh, now, there are a couple of, of exceptions, but in general, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing a generational change that, that my generation um, has dominant females that are rising up in the ranks. And as soon as the dinosaurs at the top of the pyramid, we stop feeding them, then, then there'll be some regime changes. Yeah. So do you, are you referring to leadership positions and mass torts? Or are you referring to just the industry as a whole? Yeah, I think, you know, when you look at the, the industry as a whole, you have to kind of define where the circles of power are. And so, you know, there are, have been periods of expansion and contraction as trial lawyers in law firms, mega firms, and then smaller firms. Um, I think about 20 years ago, what we saw is we saw the um, expansion of law firms that for whatever reason, the big firms were breaking apart and a bunch of defense attorneys were leaving their firms to start plaintiff's practices. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then more recently, we've seen a contraction of the market with these big mega firms that can do national advertising. So um, that's kind of one paradigm. The other paradigm is within the mass tort world is you have these enormous battleships in the mass tort world that can plunge into these cases and it requires a massive amount of capital, mm -hmm. um, which in turn has created the secondary market of people looking to invest money in these markets, um, the investment funds. And so it's, it's, it's a symbiotic relationship. And, you know, what if you're not going to have to personally bankroll, I mean, you don't need to be a billionaire anymore to play right. on this playground. Um, right. If you're a good lawyer, you know, it's kind of like being a poker player on TV. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. the guys yeah. that are playing poker on TV, they're not using their own money. Someone is providing them the seed money because of their talent. Yeah. So, you know, I'm in the, you know, business of deploying capital to law firms. That's one of the things right. I do. Um, and yeah, it's been, I've seen a massive change in the past, in the past seven, eight years. That's when I think capital really started to infiltrate this, this industry. And 
all in all, it's been a good, you know, progression, a good change. And small firms are now big firms, you know, a, a firm that could get aggregate 2000 cases with their own money are now having access to, you know, $50 million facilities and represent over 100,000 people. Now, there is obviously pros and cons with that, right? So how can you represent 100,000 people that you've never met, um, that have all kinds of needs? Can you do that in a quality manner? And I think that's becoming more of a question as these firms get bigger um, to represent these people fairly. So there, there is obviously a lot of wrinkles there. But what, in terms of your involvement, because you went from PI, single event cases, to mass torts, what is your overall perspective on the business side of mass torts? How do you feel about it? Well, I think I have... I have a couple of, of kind of overarching um, views that, yeah. and that's one of the reasons that I look forward to coming and talking to you because, you know, we, we have over the years gone in to talk about some pretty deep concepts and ideas and it spurs me. I always love talking to you because it makes me think it goes back and, and, and think some more, but, but I guess what I'm trying to, to capture I'm trying to find the right combination of words to accurately capture an idea. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's never going to be perfect, right? It's, it's, you know, Pl Plato's theory of the forms. There's no representation of the idea that's more perfect than the idea, but in general, I, I see patterns. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is I wanted, I wanted to see what patterns that you have seen over your years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people look up into the sky and they see stars mm -hmm. and they're, it's wondrous how beautiful the sky is. And some people see the pattern of the stars. And so what I see is I see a pattern and a trend that is coming where, where women are becoming empowered yeah. financially and personally. And that I think that there is, it, we've just tapped into this resource and I, I see that emerging in this industry um, and waiting for the first mega female firm to come along. And yeah. uh, I know some friends and they're friends of yours of, as well that have, have talked about it and started it, but you know, Amy Wagstaff's one of them. I think she, she uh, She's a rock star. She's a rock star. And she just got that big verdict. She's yeah. a good friend of mine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm not a lawyer, right? I am um, I am in the in the business of providing support to law firms to grow and thrive. And I wonder what my life would have been like if I went to law school. I think I I am, you know, I'm a go-getter and I probably would have, you know, tried to be on a leadership position somewhere and um but but i'm not and and being where i am where i sit today it's it's been really good for me in terms of my personal development my um my ability to be confident in what i provide the quality the feel-good causes the people we help um I feel independent. I have, as you know, my own company and I'm growing at a steady pace and it's very exciting. I, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And so I do so see let's, the let's problem. Talk about that. Let's talk yeah. about that very thing because I've gone through the same pa patterns with my own law firms. Um, what, what were the obstacles that were in place between where you are now and where you started? What were the obstacles to starting your own successful firm? And, and I first want to kind of phrase it in terms of what are the external obstacles? And then yeah. what were the internal obstacles? Well, I think the external obstacles become front and center 
uh, of your focus because sometimes you don't know how to deal with the internal obstacles. Right. I think I stopped focusing on the external focuses because I can't control others. Um, and I can't control, you know, the, the hierarchy, the food chain, you know, in the business, in our business, in any industry, really. So I just decided to focus on my own obstacles. So I went on a, on a journey and I wanted to identify what was holding me back, limiting beliefs. And then from there, um, as I became more confident in myself, there were less and less obstacles. Now, of course, there are obstacles every day. And there are times that I question my ability to do what I do all the time. Um, but I think there is this knowing now that I'm enough. Like I used to not believe that I was enough yeah. as a woman right? Um, in this business or in life or in a marriage or as a mom. Um, and I think uh, I, I worked a lot to, to overcome that. And that was really all a personal, I took full responsibility. Um, I was not a victim, even though I could cling to so many things and say, I, I've been a victim. Um, you know, before I even had an option to, or had the ability to make decisions for myself, but I'm not. And so I think that's really what's helped me continue growing myself and my business. I don't know if so that that's, that's, that's a beautiful, beautiful kind of, it captures who you are because look, when, when you showed up and when I showed up in 2012 and saw you, there's this charismatic, strong willed beautiful woman, intelligent, commanding the room, yet internally, you know, the, the, the anxiety and the stress and the uncertainty of where you were at in this new world, you know, you were walking into. Um, and, you know, that's a, a journey that is unique to you, but it's a pattern that emerges, I think, with all of us, because I, I had a similar type of journey, right? People probably would have seen me in West Virginia as this very strong, um, opinionated, um, aggressive male lawyer from a family of lawyers. And, um, but my, I had my own internal demons, mm -hmm. right? And I was trying to play in somebody else's playground and I didn't know the rules and I didn't... It wasn't until I stopped right. and made an internal checklist of who I am right. and what I am that I, it wasn't until then that I really began to blossom. And, and that's, that's a unique, that's not a unique journey. That's, they write books about it, right? They, <laughs> they, they, they have seminars about it. You can travel to exotic locations to find your Zen. Yeah. Um, but some of us kind of found it by trial and error. Yeah. When did you, when did you have that aha moment around what, what time? I, I assume it was after we met. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when I got out of law school, I went to work for my family law firm, Farrell, Farrell and Farrell. Right. Doing nothing. That. <laughs> but insurance defense work. And I studied I, I call that my um, residency. You know, I had my law license, but I wasn't really a real doctor. It, I was like in um, the, what's the TV show with Meredith Gray, Gray's Anatomy. I was in my residency. Um, <laughs> and so um, I left my family law firm and started over to be a plaintiff's lawyer working for another law firm up in Morgantown. And then I jumped from Wilson Frame, Benegar, Matheny back to another law firm as a partner, Green Ketchum. And then, you know, what, what I found is that um, I was an outsider trying to fit into somebody else's paradigm. I was, um, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm odd. Uh, You're I, a little I odd, just a little. A, a little. <laughs> a little. Um, I just think differently and I fit differently. And so I started making some assessments as to the, the pros and cons of what I wanted to do and what I wanted to be. 
And that kind of led me um, on this final journey to go and do it on my own and open up my own law firm. Yeah. Um, And then when I did that, that's when the opioid cases uh, became apparent to me. And I caught this wave Mm -hmm. and this enormous wave. I was the first to to, to see the wave because I lived there. And then it evolved into the largest, most complex MDL our judicial system is seen. And yeah. I was lucky enough to be selected to be the co-lead. And then the, an interesting thing happened is that when I sort of um, surrendered to the idea that I couldn't control everything and I, I kept my life in, a, in an open, clean direction, what I found is that whatever higher power you believe in, the path is not difficult to find. He, he puts guardrails up. She puts guardrails up on either side of the four lane highway yeah. and puts huge lights that shine the path. And to get off of that path, you have to actually crawl over, over top of a large wall and roll down a hillside. But you always know and can see the path. And what has happened in my life now is that when I stay on that path, it seems as if each time that I need something, there's somebody else sitting on a mile marker post waiting for me. Right. You know, whether it's you or Mike Papantonio or Mark Lanier or Joe Rice or my good friend, Paul Hanley, um, each of these people have come into my life and I've let it, you know, I've just kind of understood that if I just stop and listen, Mm -hmm. it's easy to hear. Mm -hmm. If I just stop to see the beauty is apparent. And sometimes we're just so bent on making everybody else hear us that we're not listening back. We're not, you know, well, some people are like um, bats and that they, they take input like sonar and all they do is just ping, 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 ping. And the feedback is what they learn from. And other people, you know, are like the owl who sit in quiet solitude with great vision and can see the entire landscape, the, the canopy. Yeah. So you know, that's kind of where I'm at now is, is I'm, I'm trying to sit back and be reflective about this new generation change that's coming, my generational change, and um, thinking about and watching for and listening for others that share the same type of vision and heart and soul, and then doing what I can to enable them. Yeah. So you go from, you know, wanting to be seen wanting to be recognized and acknowledged to, to sitting back at peace with where you are, who you are and really not worried, right. you know, because you, 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 I think that's what I feel. I feel that it doesn't matter where I am and who I'm with. Um, what I focus on makes all the difference. And I think when you experience a lot of turmoil, whether it is, you know, personal or work related or both. And you realize that you can't solve it in a state of chaos, in a state of anxiety, in a state of despair, and you let go. Um, that's when miracles happen, I think. And some of the most incredible people I've met on this journey called life have been people that let go. Yeah. And I think it's it's so important because there is, like we were talking about, there's pros and cons to the business of mass torts. It yeah. can be very, very political, very ugly, very uh, yeah. competitive and ruthless. And, and if you focus on that, that's all you're going to see. And you're not going to believe in the system and you're not going to believe in the cause. And it's just what's in it for me. Let me finish the litigation and let me let me go about my business. But I think, you know, if you focus on what, 
what you're feeling in that moment, how you can make somebody or how can you inspire someone or how can you be inspired to be moved into action for the right reasons? You just sleep better and the quality of your life improves. So it's like you said, it's simple looking at that now, but obviously there was quite, quite the journey to get here. And there's a lot of pain. So let's, let's talk about, yeah, let's, let's talk about the triggers or the, the, let's talk about the, the key points that lead to this cathartic revelation. Yeah. Right? One of the things that I think helped me a lot in this field of chaos and uh, turmoil that you talked about, right? So if, if you're a lawyer right now and you're in your late thirties, you're in your early forties and you're, you're, you've hit the plateau of, of what you think your life was going to go. And now it's going to be something else. Um, you know, one of the things that helps trigger this awareness is an analogy that I, that I use sometimes. And I read this great quote that, um, uh, said that we all learn by analogy and experience. And so I've been trying yeah. to take your storyteller. That's what you are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I want you to imagine that you're in the zoo, mm. right? And you're walking around and you have, uh, you have your child with you or, you know, and you see the lion's cage, right? Mm. Well, if you stick your arm, in the lion's cage, what's going to happen? Lion, lion's probably going to bite your arm, right? Mm -hmm. If you go into the reptile house and you pick up a snake and you're not careful with it, uh, even if it's not a venomous snake, what's a snake going to do? Now, if you go over to where the peacocks are, what do the peacocks do? You know, they f show their feathers and they strut around, right? If you go to the petting zoo and you have the gentle lambs, can you pet those? That's the world of lawyers. That's the world of people, right? Is that when you start identifying that guy right there, mm -hmm. that's a crocodile. There are very limited, son, there are very limited circumstances where you should approach the crocodile. I don't <laughs> recommend you work with them, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, or if the elephants, right, is son, this is an elephant. The elephant's probably not going to bite you. But let me just tell you, if you intend to go into a law practice with this elephant, that elephant is going to require to be fed a lot. That elephant is going to have a big footprint. So we were talking about elephants. Yes. Yeah, if you're going to go and, and you're going to join a law practice with an elephant, you're just going to have to accept the elephant's going to eat a lot of food. Yeah. And you're going to have to clean up a lot of elephant dung, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, if you go to practice with um, a bull, a bull in a china shop, you can't get mad at the bull when your law partner goes charging around wrecking everything with his horns he's a bull, right? Mm -hmm. Or like me, if you marry a beautiful wild stallion horse, <laughs> right? You can't really expect to take the stallion, beautiful, wild mountain horse and take her down to the pony show <laughs> and expect her not to nip at the show ponies. So, uh, you know, once, once I kind of took a deep breath and just said, okay, what kind of animal am I? Mm -hmm. You start going through this thought process of, first of all, that's not the right question. The right question is, is what do other people perceive me to be as an animal? Because me, I'm the human in the zoo. I'm not trying to be a lion or an elephant or an antelope. I'm trying to identify others. So, so, which, so which animal are you, Paul? Yeah. So, but see, that's 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 beautiful. That's that's the question that I want to get your mind to, to wrap around. 
is that there's a difference between the animal that we think we are and then mm -hmm. the animal that others perceive us to be. So what I want, what my initial point is, people ask that question. I want you to first consider that you're a human at yeah. the zoo making observations about all the other animals. So you don't have to be a lion to know that person's a lion, right? Lions can get along with giraffes as long as the you know you're a lion and you know that, that the giraffe is a giraffe. Yeah. The real question is, is what animal do you want other people to perceive you are? Mm -hmm. So if you want other people to perceive that you're a donkey, then act like a jackass, yeah. right? If you want other people to perceive that, you know, that you are a rhinoceros or a hippo or a deer or a zebra, there, whatever metaphor, just take a deep breath and think, what is it that people currently perceive that I am? And what is it that I want them to perceive? So I'm not asking you not to be genuine. I'm not asking you not to be real and to be who you are. But when you stop and you think about it and you think, oh, people think I'm a porcupine. Well, probably why I have relationship problems, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the internal reflection that I think you and I both went through is that we both kind of stopped and thought, okay, who are we? What do we want? I can surround myself now with peacocks. I, I used to not be able to stand peacocks, you know, with a big bloom and they strut around. I couldn't stand them. Now I'm okay. It's like, yeah, it's a peacock. They, they right. have no purpose other than dressing up and walking around, prancing around and, you know, trying... <laughs> You're thinking of people. You're you're thinking of people that that remind I, uh, you of this. A couple of people came to mind. Right, right, right. Well, look. The thing is, here's what I think. Here's as you're saying this, I'm trying to apply this to myself. I am the lion, and I am the giraffe, and I am the porcupine, and I am the donkey and I, I depending on what time of day or what's going on I think we have this innate um you know sort of desire to want we're chameleons right we're always adapting right. adjusting I find myself conforming even when I know I know better but it's almost like an instinct of wanting to conform, wanting to fit in, wanting to still turn around the energy in the room in a way that, you know, it is worth being there. So yes. even though I, to some extent, I know now more than I did, you know, in 2012, who I was, I still find myself being the, you know, being the different animals all in one day. <laughs> so, so, yeah, no, that, that, that's right. So part of the lesson is, is that when, if you want to know Morena, what you need to understand is she is a complex woman with a lot of different points in her life. And right now, do I, do I engage with her as a lion? Do yeah. I recognize, do I, do I, do I recognize that right now? What she is, is a kitten and wants to, to cuddle. Or is this the time where, you know what, if I jump in there, she's going to have sharp teeth, right? Yeah. That's part of the understanding of, of, of who we are and what we are. And sometimes the, the, other, the other aspect of it is, is that there are, there are some people that you meet that are as vast as the surface of the ocean. Yeah. Right? You, the, you would think that that's a compliment. I, I don't think that's a compliment. The, the surface of the ocean 
is a fraction of the depth of the ocean. Right. So what, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for those that have depth. And those that have depth, I want to surround myself with. And, you know, there have been books written about this. Carnegie wrote a book, you know, uh, how to, what is it? How to get rich and make friends. Or he said that his secret success was to stay away from booze, women, and to surround himself with, with people that are smarter than him. Mm-hmm. Not women like, you know, working with, but he said if he deprived himself of the, the banalities of, of life and folk surrounded himself and so that he was the dumbest person in the room, yeah. that he found the pathway to success. And so I think that we're all kind of, um, you know, reaching out and figuring out. Now, you say you're a lion, right? So here's a couple of- Sometimes. I, <laughs> I'm also, I, I, uh, you know, I, 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 think, I, I think I'm a lion too. <laughs> um, I think anybody in this industry, it's all a little bit comparative, but I have lion tendencies. So this is what I started doing. I started watching lion documentaries. Okay. And I even bought a book studying lions in the Serengeti. And I think it describes lawyers very, very well. Now, this has nothing to do with gender. This is, this is personality. Lions tend to live in a pride. So a lion's pride has at the top the eight, the alpha male. It can yeah. be a female, be a male, but it's a personality. And then underneath that alpha male are the females. And they have their own little priority, but these are all of the ass kissers to the senior partner, right? This is the <laughs> truth, right? And so as more and more cubs get born to this pride, there's this emergence and then this descendants and there's a pecking order and it's all underneath the alpha male. And so you just have to recognize if you're not the alpha male, you're somewhere in this hierarchy. So to be the alpha male, there's one of two things has to happen, right? Either you have to kill the alpha male yourself and take over the pride, or like so many of us, we choose not to try to take over this institution. We leave and we start our own prides. Mm-hmm. Within a, the pride though, there is only one alpha male. If you find a law firm with two alpha males, it's usually because they are separate prides who respect each other's territory within the firm. Mm -hmm. You're not going to find multiple alpha males in the same pride. You know, I want to, I want to say something to that because um, just recently I was, I I've been thinking about this. I, I heard it somewhere. I don't remember where, but it was the alpha male or females that learn how to tame the beast. You can still be an alpha. You Mm -hmm. still are a very dangerous man or woman, but you learn how to tame the beast. And all of the energy that you would spend trying to protect your territory, you spend nurturing relationships, sort of take a softer approach, And what happens is the world just becomes a little more, you know, comfortable, a little more, um, there is more ease in it. And so even though the ego of wanting to get ahead is still there and you are, you can still be very, very dangerous. I think learning how to tame the beast. And I I think I've met a lot of people in this business that have done that. I know what they're capable of but they have tamed the beast and it's obvious there is wisdom in their eyes. <laughs> and I think those are yeah. people who are okay with other lions coming in and having, you know, the territory, not being so protective. Um, but that's also, that was Paul Hanley, Paul Hanley. That's exactly who Paul Hanley was. <laughs> Paul Hanley was that he had battle scars after battle scars. Right. And, um, but when he saw me, he 
he, I wouldn't say nurture is the right word. He, he, he guided me through some very tough times in the right. opioid litigation. And you're right. He was no longer vying to piss on every tree. Um, and he was telling me to stop pissing on every tree, you know, marking my territory and to just, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's part of the journey. Now, here's a, here's another little side note about if you think, okay, this must lion pride thing doesn't fit me if you're listening to the podcast. Well, that's not the only type of social organization of lions. There's also the rogue pack. Right. The rogue pack are lions that have that don't have enormous infrastructures, and it's three, four, sometimes five lawyers who don't have enormous pride infrastructure, and all they do is roam around and eat when they want to eat, drink when they want to drink, fuck when they want to fuck. Am I allowed to say fuck on your podcast? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very well. Um, uh, and so um, that's a, a different social structure. But the thing about that social structure is that if you don't carry your weight in the rogue pack, the pack turns on you fairly quickly. That's right. That's right. And I think that's only fair. Yeah. Right? I mean, right. at the end of the day, I mean, you do have to pull your own weight. You and. Do. And that's the hierarchy. I think Jordan Peterson wrote a book about um, 12, 12 rules for life. I don't know if you've read the book. It, I've it, seen it, yeah. The analogy of the lobsters um, that are these very, very primitive creatures. And, and so they kind of do the same. Like they get into the fights and whoever loses just well, has to leave, you know? Right, right. No, so, but look, a lot of people don't, I want to emphasize because I'm sure there is a lot of people that tune into this podcast that are like you, you two know each other and you're having a conversation like you're at dinner over a glass of wine here. Wait a second. Who's Paul Farrell? What has he done? In yeah. And how did this all start? So you're, you, I just want to remind the audience that you're one of the first attorneys in the country, if not the first attorney in the country to bring attention to the opioid epidemic because you witnessed firsthand in your small state, home state, West Virginia, the the out the the despair, the the destruction of so many communities, um, where a tsunami of pain pills were shipped to your state for many many yeah. years, and nobody did anything about it. So tell me right. about you know this journey. Where where did that begin, and what did that trigger in you in the process? Yeah, you're right. I totally thought you and I were just catching up on a zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> I love I almost, it. <laughs> I almost forgot that we were. So, yeah. So um, there's, there's something about the MDLs that I think is worth talking about one of these days. And that is, how I came into the transvaginal mesh cases and what I learned from it in the transition. But th that's really beside the point. What, what happened is this, is that um, a newspaper writer in late 2016 got mm -hmm. access to some confidential data that was turned over um, accidentally by the DEA in a lawsuit and um, published it. And the headlines in December of 2016 said that 780 million pills were sold in the state of West Virginia over a six year window. Mm -hmm. Now West Virginia only has 1.2 million people. We were also in the midst of this horrendous opioid epidemic. And for those of you that have not seen the documentary heroin and it's, it's like the female version of heroin. It's or, it, or the, the drug heroin parentheses E. It that's a story of three women from my hometown. It was nominated for an Academy Award. Um, wow. Three three women from my hometown who have made an impact on the opioid epidemic. So the evolution of this was that 
uh, our attorney general settled the case against the big three within weeks of that headline coming out. And this newspaper article guy, he, he was documenting and he was saying, look, you all need to pay attention to this. What happened is, is that the West Virginia attorney general, he filed his lawsuits against the distributors six years ago. And the distributors hired one of their in-house lawyers to move to West Virginia and run for attorney general and beat our, you know, our, our sitting attorney general. And now he's settling this case for peanuts. And that pissed me off. Um, Eric Ayer for the Charleston Gazette, he won the 2017 Pulitzer Prize for investigative journalism. Wow. Right. And so I kind of felt like it was, I had to take the next step. Right. And so um, I talked it over with my family and um, went to my law partners. And I said, look, you know, I've, I've been providing for this law firm for the past several years and I'm going to take on this case and y'all need to step it up to pay the bills. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So I started thinking about big picture, right? And, and this is the lesson that maybe I'll teach a class on one day is, is I deconstructed this case all the way back to its origins. Okay, our attorney general settled a case on my behalf. Well, he's just the attorney for the government, state government. How does he represent me? I started thinking about this and reading about public nuisance and understanding who it is that represents us and how we decided to govern ourselves, right? Our social contract, Rousseau's on social contract. What is it that we've decided is, is the, the right representative for me? And it turns out in West Virginia, the rules say that the county governments have the power to bring public nuisance cases. So I really didn't give a shit what the attorney general did. I filed a case on behalf of the Cabell County Commission. And I said, look, I don't know how far this is going to go, but I'll represent you. Um, it's free unless I win. What right. that means is that I'll take it on contingency fee. I'll pay for everything. If we lose, I eat the costs. If we win, I get paid You know, 25%. And they are like... We don't understand, Paul. What, why, why would we, what, who are these distributor people? Yeah. And so then I showed them the, the data of how many pills. I said, these people brought delivery trucks to Huntington, West Virginia, and they delivered 10 million pills a year for 15 years. We have 100,000 people. Let's, let's back up. There's 100,000 people in my hometown. And somebody sold 10 million pills a year. We had pharmacists shut down by the DEA. We had doctors that went to prison, famously went to prison. They wrote books about some of the doctors in the region, right? There's a book called Dreamland by Sam Quinones. It chronicles the Ohio River Valley and what happened here. And yet the distributors, the wholesalers were delivering it in, in trucks, trucks of opium pills. Yeah. So to put this into a little more perspective, let's talk about opium. Some say that when Pandora's box was first opened, the first thing that popped out was opium because it's been around since the Byzantine era. Yeah. It's, it's, it's opium. It's, it's addictive. It's opium. I mean, I don't even know what more to say. So, so you we fought wars, the opium wars. Like you, you remember from history that yeah. when the British held India, you know, the, with the sun that never sets on the British Empire. Well, that was an expensive endeavor, and so the British needed to pay for India, and they used India's number one cash crop, opium, from the yeah. poppy plant. But they didn't want to sully themselves with being opium dealers, so they gave it a contract to the East India Trade Company to sell all the opium. So the East India Trade Company built the world's largest Navy and shipped opium from India to China. 
Now, here's the, here's the beautiful part of this story. The Chinese thought the white man were barbarians, hairy, smelly, <laughs> disgusting sailors, and refused to allow them to come onto the mainland and only allowed the white man to land in the peninsula mm-hmm. to sell their wares. Well, after delivering so much opium, the Chinese emperor, he noted that there was problems. And so he passed a rule that if you got caught smoking opium, you got publicly whipped in the public square. Well, after whipping 10 million Chinese, the emperor thought, you know what, this isn't working. We're going to try to arrest our way out of the problem. We're going to execute drug dealers. So after executing two and a half million drug dealers, he said, you know what? We can't arrest our way out of the problem. Let's stop down. Let's stop the supply. So they barricaded the peninsula. And so the East India Trade Company responded by using the war powers given to them by the British government. And they occupied that peninsula that we now call Hong Kong. Yeah. And the British never gave up Hong Kong until the year 2000. They yeah. toppled the Chinese empire. It triggered the Boxer Rebellion and the diaspora of opium to the United States, where we began this cycle all over again. Because there's no new evil in the world. We just reinvent pain. So that led to the 1914 Harrison Narcotic Act, laudanum, delauded. And then the next black swan event is the great American pharmaceutical industry decides we can make the molecular structure of opium even more powerful and they invent Oxycontin, yeah. right? So in my hometown, 20% of the babies that are born are born addicted to opium, Right. That generation has gotten old enough now that they are now into elementary school and they're having enormous functional, um, emotional, physical, intellectual delays. Um, we just have started this, this, the beginning of this. And so I just got pissed off and I decided to sue the sons of bitches. And the next thing you know, my neighbors called over in Boone County, Kentucky, um, up in Ohio, Scioto County, Ohio. And the next thing you know, I run into Pat and Mike Papatonio and Russell Budd. And we start signing up clients and I ended up with about 700 of them. And then they all got consolidated into the MDL. And because of the backing of Russell Budd and Mike Papantonio, and because, you know, they started with my clients, um, they selected me to be the co-lead of the MDO. I remember you um, going to Mass Tort Make Perfect and getting up on stage and talking about the opioid litigation. You were, it was the first time anybody had heard about it, you know, yep. in that setting. And I thought to myself, oh, my God, I know that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I cannot believe you're here. And, you know, I, I, I was in mass torts already. So I've been doing business in mass torts for many years. And I was always, you know, telling my single event attorneys to get into mass torts. But then when you came along and, you know, the cause and the passion, I thought, wow, this is different. This is definitely different. Um, and I know it's an ongoing war. Um <laughs> And you just finished the trial in opioids and you're pending, I assume, a verdict on that? Yeah. yeah we, we elected for a bench trial for a number of reasons. Yeah. We, thought we, could, we thought we could get a, a bench trial done in April of 2020 and COVID hit. Yeah. yeah. Right. So we tried the case in the summer of 2021 four months and um, we're waiting for the result to come back. So is there hope? I mean, I know a lot of awareness has been raised um, by declaring war on opioids, but I mean, what does the recovery look like for these communities for, for this country? So look, the, the, 
there have been several different models that we can look at and see. It, it has usually taken like World War I. It took World War I to get America out of the first opioid epidemic. Right. Um, in China, it took the toppling of the empire before it stopped there. Um, had we not stopped what we're doing, what we would have found is we would have found a dependency that is beyond any, anything that can be fathomed. What we know now from looking at the prescription data is that if you're prescribed these opioid pills after surgery or a back injury or a dental procedure, if you're prescribed a one week prescription and you take the first pill, 7% of the population is still seeking refills a year later. Wow. If you get the first prescription for seven days and you refill it, so now you've finished your second week, 18% of those that um, refilled their first prescription are still getting refills a year later. And if you take 30 days and you get the refill for the second month, 38% of the American population is still taking refills a year later. So the thing that, we do, that, that is shocking to us is that we were only able to see the volume of pills from the distributors to the pharmacies because the federal government doesn't have visibility at the pharmacy level or the doctor level. The state boards of medicine and pharmacy, they don't have visibility unless they issue subpoenas. So we didn't have a mechanism to understand where these pills were going. All we could really see is the volume going into communities in mass. So the way that opium works is if the first time you smoke it or take the opium pill, your brain has a euphoric reaction to it. And so it's been described as imagine the euphoria that you feel winning the lottery. The greatest amount of euphoria that you could possibly feel. The first hit of opium has a serotonin release 10 times that. Dopamine release 10 times that. Right. 10 times. The first hit of heroin is, has a dopamine response neurologically 10 times what the human body can possibly bring up. But as you continue to take the, the pills, you never reach that peak again. And when you stop taking the pills, your body is seeking to fill the void just to be functional. So if we were to unveil the medical records across the country right now, what you would find are housewives, CEOs, police officers, firemen, doctors, politicians. You would see normal functioning people that now I'd have to take opium just to function normally. Let me you ask can't you. Even say that. Yeah. Is, do you think opium or opioids is a symptom of our human um, state, uh, nature, or is it the cause of, you know what I'm, what I'm trying to ask? So it is, is this a, a, a reason or is this a symptom or is it a cause for the damage that's been done? Yeah, I, th I think, let me see if I can rephrase it a little bit. Yeah. Some people, some people want to stigmatize opium use as yeah. a, a choice, mm -hmm. as like um, if you decide to be unfaithful, commit adultery, right? if you decide to murder someone, if you mm -hmm. decide to drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes, it's just easy just to say, uh, no, I'm choosing not to do that right? Whatever morality factor you want to put on it. 
opium removes that choice. In fact, the definition of an addict mm. is one who no longer has the voluntary choice anymore. So mm. I think that what the, what this is not a symptom of a degenerate society. We have a degenerate society. I love our degenerate society, right? <laughs> This isn't a symptom of our degenerate society. This is opium. It has been around for a very long time. And what we can keep doing is we keep figuring out how to make it more potent. Right? We started with just taking the sap and smoking it. You know, then we refined it using chemicals to turn it into, you know, to heroin or something. Now what we have done is we've gotten our scientists to take the most euphoric and addictive molecule within the poppy plant and mass produce it into little pills and then validate it through doctor's prescriptions and putting it in those little pill bottles in mom and dad's cabinet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's, it's an escape, right? A lot yeah. of people can't live with themselves or uh, are looking to escape, to numb. And even though the destruction that is caused by opioids is enormous, um, people elect it over their inter internal turmoil sometimes, right? It maybe starts there and then it takes over yeah. and then you don't even have a choice in the matter after you become fully addicted to it. It's just, it's not even something you can control, right? Well, so, so the latter half of it, I agree with. The first half of it is a subset. So yes, there are people that were taking opioids for the feeling of it. Right? Yeah. But the funerals that I've been to, the funerals of the, of the, of the children of my friends that I've been to, their stories weren't thrill-seeking, pill-seeking behaviors. Some of their stories were they had a surgery or they had a dental procedure or right. they had a back sprain or an ankle sprain or, you know, and that the doctor prescribed them, you know, they had a mole removed on their back right? and they got a 30-day supply of hydrocodone, Right. Yeah. And so the stories, they don't all start innocuous. Obviously, there were stories of the kids that were partiers and hellions and smoking cigarettes in the bathroom. You know, remember that? Remember back when the kids that were the bad kids were smoking cigarettes. Now in, they're, they're smoking fentanyl laced joints, <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, obviously, this has had a major impact on you, right? As a father, as a husband, as a lawyer. And this is heavy. This is a very heavy cross to yeah. carry. So how, you know, how, how do you internalize and process this on a daily basis as you do the work? Oh, wow. That's like, um, <laughs> so I don't, you, I don't know if you remember, but when we met back in 2012, I had a very robust social life. Yeah. You went out. <laughs> yeah. <And> so, <laughs> um, what happened is that I had some friends lose their, a child and, um, life kind of smacked me in the face a little bit and I sobered up and that doesn't mean I don't drink anymore or go out and party. Um, but I just have a different view of life now. Yeah. I can't, it's hard to explain, but you know, when I'll go out to dinner and I'll have drinks with dinner, a glass of wine. And then when everybody else wants to go to the bar and drink till two in the morning, I'm going to bed. Yeah. That's called getting old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Me too, by the way. And, and, I can't uh, I can't do anything after uh, dinner. I'm I'm I out. can't do it. <laughs> now I'll day drink. I'll day drink and watch some football. 
Right. Um, but <laughs> at what, home. But what I have found, <laughs> right, right. But what I have found is that the Hank Williams song, The Hangovers Hurt More Than They Used To, is not only true, but it also diffuses my focus. Yeah. It interferes yeah, yeah. with my relationships. Yeah. And so yeah. I, 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 I can't, I, I just choose not to function like that anymore. Right. And um, it has helped me because this has been a difficult journey for me personally. Let me, let me, let me share a story with you. I felt a little bit like, like Superman. <laughs> and I had, a, I had a, a, a good friend whose daughter um, was an addict and I knew she was an addict and she gave up custody of her child to her parents and they got divorced. Um, so I got a phone call one day from grandpa and these, this is Huntington, West Virginia. And so the, fa we, the families, we all know each other. So grandpa calls me and he says, Paul, Paul, um, my granddaughter is here. And I think she's having some type of psychosis. She's not making any sense. She, she says she's not using again, but she, she's, she's talking nonsense. I don't, I don't understand. I said, all right, put, put her on the phone. So she gets on the phone and I said, and she says, Paul, I just want to stop stop. I just want you to listen to me. You and I both know that when you chase the dragon as high as the high gets, you're going to get, find a low. I said, you and I both know you're using again. I want you to go to rehab. And she says, I'm not going to do it, Paul. I'm not going to do it. And I said, what if, what if I make the phone call and we just go to, and there was a rehab hospital and you don't have to wait on a bed and you can just go in and just get some sleep for 48 hours, voluntarily go in. And she goes, okay, I'll do that. So I tell grandpa, she's going to go in. So um, I call the, the hospital. They're waiting for her at the back door. Grandpa pulls in in his pickup truck. Um, he gets out, she gets out, and she takes off running. So grandpa calls me, mom and dad call me, and they say, what do we do now? And I said, well, it's real easy. My dad's the judge. Let's just start the, the involuntary process. So they went down the courthouse, and they had her involuntarily committed and next time the, the police found her on the streets, they picked her up and they involuntarily put her in. And she stayed 30 days. She got out on a Sunday. And the family had a dinner. The whole family got together, including her daughter. And they had this big dinner. It was the first 30 days of sobriety she had had in four years. Wow. Well. The next morning, Grandpa um, found her in the bathroom on the floor, dead with a needle in her arm. And so I have carried that on my soul for, because, you know, this is what happens is they go 30 days. They think they can handle the same amount of heroin. They take the load and then it's so much that their brain stops breathe, telling them to breathe. And so, you know, that's, that's a death on my hands. And so that's a little girl that started, she got, she got her first prescription after a dental procedure. Wow. Wow. And so that's why I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. that, that's why it doesn't matter if I lose the first case, there's 700 other cases. You're going to have to beat me 700 times. And one of those times I'm going to bankrupt you. Because those, th there's still no accountability. You asked me earlier whether or not we've made a difference. The answer is no. There's a $21 billion settlement and their stock prices didn't change. Yeah. So, so that's why I spent four months. The rest of the country was working on a settlement agreement. I carved my hometown out with their permission. And we went to trial. 
and everybody's like, you're crazy. You're crazy. There's $21 billion. It's like everybody else can split up the 21 billion. But I got authority from my hometown is that we're not taking payments over years. What we're doing is we want return to us a verdict in blood. That's what we want. We want to create a historical record of what these motherfuckers did, how blatant they are. And I don't know if you followed my trial or not. The, the people who were in charge of the corporate security were writing emails to each other, making fun of the Beverly Pillbillies. No. Oh, y- yes. Literally, lit- the people who... Congress said you can sell opium pills, but you have to follow the law and look for suspicious orders and have a monitoring system. Literally, the person who was in charge of my hometown for watching for unusual volumes of pills was circulating a parody of the Beverly Hillbillies theme song, replacing it with Pillbillies, Mountaineers and Pillbillies. When Kentucky passed a statute limiting the number of pills that can be prescribed on first instance, they circulated an email and said, it looks like some of the hillbillies are learning to read. Wow. These are the people that were in charge of my hometown. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, we're going, there's going to be something special that happens, right? Magic or tragic. The end of the year this year or the beginning of January, we're going to have a verdict. And our judge is an 82 year old conservative federal judge who has a master's and a PhD in history. He's, and I asked him in closing arguments, I said to him, I'm going to present to you the facts. I want you to write the historical truth of what happened in our hometown. And my, everybody tells me that, Paul, you're taking a big risk. I'm not taking a big risk. My clients gave me authority. I'm trying to make a difference. I want, I want this thing in the historical record. Yeah. And so the second thing for you to watch out for is that um, there's been a documentary film crew following me around for four years. So literally, like I told you on the whole guy, the pathway and people waiting for me. Yeah. My law, part, my law partner, Larry Tweel, his uh, nephew is a filmmaker. He did Gleason, the story of the New Orleans Saints guy that got yeah. uh, ALS. Yeah. Um, uh, and he had just finished a project when he came home for a funeral and ran to his uncle. And his uncle said, you need to go talk to Paul Jr. And so he came to see me. And I told him I had the status conference for the first status conference in March of 2017 for the opioid case. Yeah. And he tagged along with me with a camera. And he stuck around and he's been filming for four years. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. And so um, he, he is hoping that uh, he's got some big backers. He's seen the, and so he's hoping that it's going to maybe get another nomination. So that would be amazing. When is that? When, when is it going to be for public consumption? I think it, um, they were going to show it last year at um sundance and then but they're they're waiting for the result and so um so they're not showing it at sundance this year they may show it later in the spring but i would imagine it'll be out by summer okay wow yeah it's called it's it's called the bellwether right i like i like that that's That's a great great title Well, like I said, I didn't know this, but like I said in my intro, I mean, I think movies are going to be made and books are going to be written. This is, this is, I think, one of the most important yeah. causes, you know, that that deserves the attention, the awareness. Um, I oh, do. There's a there's a book coming out too. The 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 um, the Washington Post writer Scott Hyam, okay, um, and Sari Horowitz. They're the ones that broke the whole DEA story with Joe Ranazissi that showed up on 60 Minutes. They took a a year leave of absence from the Washington Post to write a book. The first half of the book is the story of Joe Ranazissi at the DEA and his whistleblowing. And the second half of the book is about our trial. 
So it's pretty cool. That's awesome. What's the name of the book? Oh, you asked me too quick. I don't even know if I know the name of the book. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, Scott Hyam and, okay. and Sar- they, they both have won Pulitzers. And so um, they got pretty high hopes on this book. Okay. Well, I want to I wanna switch gears just a little bit because there is another very, very interesting thing um, that mm-hmm. you did. In 2016, you ran for president of the United States. I yep. remember thinking when I saw this on Facebook, I remember thinking, I think he's lost his mind. <laughs> like, yeah. like there goes, there goes Paul. Um, but you right. know, doing some some due diligence, I saw you know, really what was going on. So Bernie Sanders had defeated Hillary Clinton uh, in West Virginia's Democratic presidential primary. And it was a 51-36, I think. Um, And then the other 13% went to you, a local lawyer who did no fundraising, um, spend no money on. Yeah, campaign. you're reading the New York Times piece on it. Yeah, I am, and you paid twenty five hundred dollars to yeah. put your name on the ballot to protest how Democrats have treated the coal industry in West Virginia. Yep. So you've never told me the story directly, but you know, be, West Virginia. I mean, West Virginia has gone through a lot, right? Between yeah, the coal. Right coal industry right. and the opioid industry i mean jesus so clearly it's it's a neglected state by both right uh, republicans and democrats do you think anything has changed and and you're no. you're doing it to prove a point like tell me about yes. that experience <clears throat> all right so so here's what happened is um i'm gonna say this first i i I, if I were to rank my presidents from one to whatever they are, Barack Obama is number one. That's, you know, to me, he is the most brilliant. He's the smartest, most charismatic. He, he, presidential. all of that is presidential. Yeah. Um, but he fucked my home state. <laughs> yeah. It's the only thing that I have to say about him. So, okay. so here, here's the crazy thing that happened in 19, 19- 70 something nixon passed the environmental protection act and they basically said hey we need to stop polluting the wind and the water and so congress was tasked with coming up and identifying pollutants and politics got involved and up until 1990 they had never mentioned anything about mercury from the coal mines. The coal mines were not regulated for the discharge of coal burning facilities, right? The coal power plants were not on the list. So there was a huge study that was commissioned to study the output of the coal burning power plants to see what in those plumes is dangerous. Mm-hmm. And it, the focus was on mercury because mercury, as the theory goes, was being burned in the coal and it was then winding up in the waters, being absorbed by fish, being eaten by mothers and showing up in the livers of babies. So the study that comes out in 1990, the EPA says, you know what? There's not a strong enough scientific basis to say that that mercury came from these coal stacks. That was old man Bush. So there was no regulation. Clinton comes in and his EPA, based on the same study, reached the opposite conclusion. And so the regulators began trying to implement that rule. But by the time the rule came up, Clinton was out, Gore lost, right. and young Bush came in. He flipped it back. He took the same results that his dad did and said, nope. Right. 
So then along comes Barack Obama. And Barack Obama, when he ran the first time, said, I'm going to implement clean water, clean air. I'm going to put, I'm not, I can't outlaw burning of coal, but what I can do is I can make it so expensive that it puts the coal, the coal burning power plants into bankruptcy. That's what he said. Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton came to my state and won. She beat Obama in West Virginia. And she went around, and I, I have, I, it's on my website. She w- made a, her acceptance speech where yeah. she walked in and said, I'm a granddaughter of a coal miner, and I will never forget you, and I will never leave you. Right. Well, eight years later, Hillary Clinton shows up, and she's saying things like on national television, we're going to put a lot of coal companies out of business, right? Barack Obama used the EPA to implement the rule finally. And as soon as he implemented that rule, it, it put the pension funds, the steel industry, and the coal industry into bankruptcy in West Virginia. Now, all that being said, okay, we also waged war not just on coal, but we also waged a war on terror. We bombed Afghanistan and Iraq back into the Middle Ages. And then we spent billions of dollars rebuilding their infrastructure. And guess what else we built? Guess what we built Afghanistan and Iraq? We built them power plants. And not only did we build them power plants, we built them fossil fuel burning power plants. So we're over in Iraq and Afghanistan building fossil fuel burning power plants. And we're back in the United States and we're putting coal companies out of business. And we don't even have the decency to, to, to reimburse their pension funds. Yeah. So I was pissed. So I went to Joe Manchin. I read a book about Robert C. Byrd, Senator Byrd. Yeah. I went, I went to Joe Manchin and I said, Joe, I got this idea. The presidential election is in 2016. You have to run for your U.S. Senate seat again in 2018. Why don't you do what Bob Byrd did in 1976? Mm -hmm. Run for president only in West Virginia. You can go around the entire state. You can raise a war chest for your 2018 campaign run. And you can go around and your entire premise is this, is I'm running to capture all 33 delegates to the Democratic National Convention from West Virginia. And I'm going to do the same thing Bob Byrd did, is that he got 31 of 33 votes. He got 92% of the votes. And when the Democrats wanted Jimmy Carter to be president, he said, no, I'm holding out. I won't release my votes until... Jimmy Carter came to him and said, Bob, what's going on? We won. And he said, I want to be majority leader. Yeah. I said, I said, Joe, all you got to do is you'll go, you'll win the state. And then you go to Hillary and you say, Hillary, I will pledge you the West Virginia votes. Mm -hmm. If you put in your 100 day plan funding of the coal mine pension bill that I'm sponsoring. Right. That's it. And he said, no, he said, Hillary and Bill are vindictive. And I think that will jeopardize the coal mine pension bill rather than support it. And that pissed me off to no end. So I was in a mediation in Charleston, West Virginia. When I took that call from Joe Manchin, I got up, I went down the Capitol I wrote a $2,500 check and I put my name on the ballot. Because I knew intrinsically that the people of West Virginia were not going to tolerate Hillary Clinton, not because she was a woman, had nothing to do with her being a woman. Right. I believe that. Right. It had to do with the fact that she went on national television in the midst of what we were experiencing. And it's on there. She she said in a a town hall, we're going to put a lot of coal companies and coal miners out of business. Right. She had to make an apology tour for that, but it's too late. 
right? So I was pissed. I wrote a big editorial, put it in the newspaper. And um, the funny thing is, is that if you win 15% in any one of the three congressional districts, mm -hmm. you get three automatic votes or three automatic delegates to the national convention. And I won 14.6% in the third congressional district. I was like 200 plus votes away from getting delegates to the, to the, without raising a dollar or spending a dollar. But that's, again, it, it uh, was a futile effort. Um, I ran for president. I lost. Thanks for reminding me, you know, <laughs> great, great way no. to, great way to end this is reminding me of the biggest, the, the loss on the biggest stage of my career. The only thing that could be of, of a bigger loss is if I lose the, my hometown's opioid case. So I'm sure we can have, we can have a, a podcast about that if that surpasses my humiliation on the national presidential stage. I mean, look, if, if I can live a life where I'm taking on causes to make the, the country, the, the home state a little better than before, and I'm losing in the process, I think I'm, I'm, I'm still okay with it. And I think you are too. You, yeah. you are still winning. Um, and, and that's, I tell this to a lot of lawyers that get into mass torts that say, you know, I want to set a record for this mass tort. I want to prove a point. And sometimes I have to remind them that even if they don't get the highest verdict and they don't win what they thought they would initially win, they've already done so much service to the cause by bringing the awareness because there had look it's even though we haven't seen tangible change i think people have become a lot more aware yeah of what was going on than ever before and i think that, is that right. you're right it's incredible like we, and, we 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 made a difference the cdc issued new guidelines the yeah. standard of care has changed we, we've made a difference. We yeah. truly have made a difference. But, but here's what I have to say. The next time, the next time one of these people says they want to prove something and they want to set a record, this is what you should tell them. Go coach a local high school girls soccer team. Go, go build a, a, a new little league field, right? Mm -hmm. Because people like me, we don't give two shits whether or not you get a big verdict or not. But I yeah. guarantee you that there's a score of families that will appreciate you if you do something for them. You know, local community is where it is, right? Thomas Jefferson. I'm a Jeffersonian Democrat. Actually, I'm an independent. I protested the Democratic Party for a variety of reasons and changed my affiliation. But I'm a Jeffersonian Democrat in a constitutional sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Okay. Um, you are not living in West Virginia. I am not. You're living in Puerto Rico. I am living in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And why is that? Well, my tax lawyer tells me not to say it's for taxes. Um, but I am a rebel enough to say for the taxes. So here's, here's what uh, the new paradigm is, right? Is... There are lawyers that have come to Puerto Rico for tax shelters, mm -hmm. try to avoid it, right? Mm -hmm. And it had never crossed my mind until COVID hit. When COVID hit, the practice of law has changed. This here, this Zoom, this was not capable. We weren't capable of doing this pre-COVID, mm -hmm. right? I used to literally, when I, I had a house in Tampa, I would get on the, the uh, Frontier jet for $128 and I would fly up to Cleveland from Tampa and go to a hearing and then get on the Frontier and come back to Tampa and make the round trip. Nowadays, we just get on this thing, status conference on this. Yeah. In, the, in the CT2 trial, we did all our depositions by video. The, the Santa Clara trial, the opioid trial, it was done remotely. Mm -hmm. right? So the practice of law is changing and it's going to be more and more remote just like this. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So I can either sit behind a telescope a screen and pay 40% income taxes in West Virginia, or I can sit behind the same screen in San Juan, Puerto Rico and pay zero federal income tax. Mm -hmm. Now it takes a little bit more than just that. You have to actually move to Puerto Rico. (laughs) This is, this is, this is my place. So my, my, my youngest just enrolled as a freshman at the university of Florida. So Jackie and I are empty nesters. Mm -hmm. The practice of law has changed. I have gone on to the more of the mass tort world and it just made sense. And then I was running around uh, tilting at um, windmills with our mutual good friend, Mike Fuller. Mm -hmm. And then through the opioid cases. And then he said, hey, let's make a new law firm. And mm-hmm. so when we, when we decided, uh, I started thinking about my lions and I started thinking for the first time in maybe my life, I've got a lion that's my brother that I want to run with. Mm-hmm. And um, so we became our own rogue pack and we started doing the analysis. And from a tax standpoint, if we're going to start something fresh, there's no place better to do it than in San Juan, Puerto Rico. So I was lucky enough that I didn't have the baggage of an old law firm. I'd left my old law firm and created my own. My kids were gone. I have a forgiving wife. <laughs> and so uh, we started our own law firm, Farrell and Fuller in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Yeah. Does anybody give you shit for it, for yes. leaving West Virginia? Who does? Um, you know, not so much in West Virginia. It's, it's more of the other lawyers in the mass tort world who wish they weren't so encumbered with, with uh, pride hierarchy that they can't make the move. But right. Um, right. yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I love it that you, you are, you know, in Puerto Rico and, um, and I think there's nothing wrong, right? You, you, you've paid your dues, you're still paying your dues, you're still fighting the fight. And if you can do it from a sunny place, um, yeah. that's, got warmer weather and can give you those benefits, then why not? You know? Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, look, it, people are, are afraid that, you know, by talking about it, that the IRS is going to come looking. Well, look, I, I, I've said this before. If the IRS comes and looks, that's great. Come look. There is <laughs> nothing about, <laughs> there is nothing about me that, Well, there's a lot that I'm embarrassed about, but there's nothing that I won't show you if you ask nicely. And um, I'm following every letter of the law. This isn't a loophole. This isn't some extraordinary, crazy backdoor thing. The people of Puerto Rico have been devastated time and time again. And when you go and you read the history, you asked me what the last book I read was. The last book I read was about the failed national insurrection in Puerto Rico after the United States came in, tried to sterilize half the population, bought up all of the, the, the farms, devastated this entire area. No wonder they hate us. And then the hurricane came and hit and devastated this. And so what they do is they've got this incentive program. What they say is, if you bring your business here, we'll yeah. give you a certificate for 15 years to avoid federal income tax. Yeah. Bring your, bring, come here. We have... We have hundreds of unemployed 25-year-old lawyers looking for a job. They're lining up to come work for us. And so, yeah, I'm here. I'm a Puerto Rican resident. I'm proud. I got nothing to hide. Come join me. That that's funny you said that because that reminds me um, trying to leave Albania, my country of birth. um, That. I was applying for a student visa and I got rejected several times before I got approved. But I remember that the people that would go in the embassy and would apply and show that they had a hundred thousand dollars in cash, which very few people did by the way, but they showed a hundred thousand dollars in cash and that they wanted to go invest it in the United States, that they would get a visa automatically. Mm -hmm. These were so the incentive to bring people with money into the country, right? 
to the right. United States is there. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. I completely agree. And I know a lot of people that are there, attorneys, master yeah. attorneys that are very happy. And they're saying the same thing that in, instead of hiring paralegals, they're hiring lawyers. That's exactly right. The same amount of money that they would pay a paralegal and do really good work. And they're very pleased with it. So good for you for being, um, you know, sort of, you know, one of the first people to, to do it and, and admit it and not be, you know, yeah. feeling like you have to live, live under the radar so that people don't know. I mean, yeah. yeah. Like I, I'm in downtown San Juan in Condado. Uh, you know, I, uh, I have volunteered to teach a class at the law school this coming semester. Um, I've gone the, the Ponce museum here um, has still not recovered from the um, hurricane. And so I'm raising money to help return their art and culture back to their Ponce Museum. Um, it's just, um, I felt like I did, I, I don't know. I felt I needed a fresh start too. Yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 I just, I, I, I said my piece in several different ways in several different manners. Um, I hope that I've made some difference, but I'm okay with doing my best to change and then being okay with it. Right. So what's next for you, Paul? <laughs> well, uh, I've been hired by, um, 300 newspapers to sue Google for antitrust, um, over their digital ad space. So, um, that's the next dragon we're going to slay. Okay. That's very cool. Is that, are you going to focus just on that? Or are you going to try to build like a mass tort firm with trying different cases and being in different trials? Yeah. I don't know. You know, um, my ego has taken a enormous pummeling over the last four years, the ego that I thought I had. Now I have a different set of egos. And so um, I don't know that I'm going to stay in the mass tort world. I don't know. Um, I certainly have leapt to the very top of the food chain with a resume that I could put my name into whatever. But I, I think, man, I just, I'm going to have to believe in a cause. I think, mm -hmm. I think, I think that's what attracted me to Google is that, you know, they, they've exercised more, um, anti-competitive behavior and they hold more monopoly power than standard oil did when we broke it up in 1914, um, more than Ma Bell did when we broke them up in the eighties. And so this is the single largest monolithic monopoly in the history of the world. And as a consequence, we've, you, I don't know if people realize this, we have lost 50% of our newspapers in America mm -hmm. in the past 10 years. 50%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we want to wonder why there's such a polarization of politics and media right now. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because we're not reading the local newspaper anymore. We're on CNN and Fox. Right. Right. The Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. Yeah. Right? You know, we're, we're, we don't have the balance anymore of a left and a right view from our hometowns anymore. Most communities only have, if they don't have two newspapers anymore, and they're lucky to have one. And that's because the marketplace has been strangled, and I'm going to fix it. Mm -hmm. Can you also sue Instagram and Facebook and TikTok, please, on my behalf, for the damage they do to my teenage daughter? <laughs> yeah. It's, Is that coming? <laughs> you know, the it's a different world and this is a completely different podcast, but yeah, yeah, for sure. The, my children being raised on. So, so, so my parents thought it was the end of the world that our generation watched so much television. Right. Right. We think it's the end of the world that our kids have so much social media, but the biggest difference is this is the amount of violent and sexual con content. Con content 
being exposed to these young minds is impacting their view of sexuality, individual sexuality. And um, I'm not here to say whether or not it's a good or a bad impact, but. um, It's an addiction. It's the next opioids, I think. It's a distorted view of reality. Yeah, it's. There is, I mean, I think think the single most contentious, uh, you know, reason why my my family experiences, you know, issues with a teenager is the phone, the phone addiction and what it can do. And it's not like you can see it is like you were saying, like the release of dopamine. Yes. Just it's like the addiction, like it's designed that way. They, my they, daughter starts itching if she can't find her phone. You know, it's like, where is yeah. my phone? What I miss? Yeah, yeah. Have you seen the documentary, The Social Network? I have not. No, no. The Social Dilemma. The Social Dilemma. Oh, dear, sweet pea. You, you, need, to, you need to watch that tonight and you may never allow your, your daughter on Facebook again. Yeah, no, I, I, I've watched some similar documentaries. I, I might might have watched this. No, this um, is the insiders. These, this is the yeah. insiders on the data they're collecting on us and right. how they're feeding and controlling through algorithms, the right. predictive modeling. It's terrible. Yeah. It's yeah. Terrible. I think that's the next opioids, um, really, for our for that next generation. If if we can subdue the opioid epidemic. <laughs> you know, and get that under control. I think this is going to be the next fight. Um, Well, look, it's, it's, I could talk to you for hours and it's, I think been close to two hours and, you know, it's only been an hour. You said, you (laughs) said that we would get just, we would start with an hour and kind of break the ice and then we would get into the real stuff. We haven't even gotten into the real stuff. I I can, I can keep going, Paul. (laughs) (laughs) I love this. This is, this is my, my, you know, this gets me going and it, it's very inspiring. So thank you for, for making time. And I think I would love to, to have you on a panel soon. I'm, I'm thinking of doing a panel with, you know, lawyers and sharing views and, you know, just getting new conversations started, but it's always a joy to, to speak with you. And I'm just so proud of you. You've come right. so far. <laughs> So I, I will agree to be on your panel, but I'll, you have to allow me to, um, I won't pick the, the lawyers, but I get to pick the categories. You got to put a peacock on, you got to <laughs> put an elephant on, Absolutely. <laughs> and then, and then we'll have a, we'll have like the, the wrap up shows, you know, like with, uh, the um you know the bachelorette there's a wrap-up show we'll put all of the the animals on and then afterwards we'll have a wrap-up show and we'll talk about how the peacock responded when the lion you know chirped at it it'll be (laughs) it'll be it'll be great it'll be great i think i think that sounds awesome i think a lot of people would would want to participate um all right well thank you love you love you too